welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. Today, I'm interviewing the one, the only David Waxman. David and I are partners at 10110, where we write million dollar checks into seed stage companies. David has been the founder of three companies. He raised venture for all three, had one IPO, one acquisition, one crash and burn. And of course, he is one of the founders of 10110. There is so much to get into. David, thank you for putting up with all this podcasting and coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you know, I like to start with the basics. So maybe you could start me off by telling me how many pets do you have in your house right now? That's a hard question. I can let me count them off. It's two dogs, three cats, a leopard gecko, a snake, six chickens, two guinea pigs. I think that's it. That was good. Oh, Oh. not that's excluding my worm bin because I can't (laughs) count all of them. No, you're not supposed to. So, okay. So the branding of 10110, um, I think a bit we've, we lean into this nice and nerdy brand. So tell me, how do you feel about that branding? I feel like it's, well, it's true. I think I, I like to think I'm nice and I'm definitely nerdy. And I think we're all that, you know, I'm, we've all started companies, but we've all also, you know, had these technical educations and we have hung out with other nerdy people and we... We can refer to Star Trek episodes and all those things that nerds are supposed to be able to do. Okay, so you started 10110 with Gil Elbaz. Who's nerdier? Different. I think I'm more pop culture nerdy. I think he's more OG, like legit nerdy. What does that mean? Like more Caltech nerd? He's more Caltech, you know, he can write sequel. I can't write sequel. You could. It's not that hard. <laughs> no, it's not that hard, but but Gil used to do it for a living. Okay, fair enough. I won't ask who's nicer. You're both very nice. Quite different. Oh, I agree. How would you characterize the difference between you and Gil? Oh, we're so, di- we're, we, it's weird because we have a lot of similarities of background and of taste, and then just some parts where we're really dissimilar. I, I would, I mean, I don't know how to say it otherwise. I'm much more emotional than he is, or at least on the surface. Like he doesn't show a lot of emotion. I'm not sure if you've noticed. He computes uh, things. He computes things more than I do. And actually, yeah, it, at some level, we're nothing alike because I'm, more gut driven and he is gut driven, but his gut is actually a computer. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I'm going to try to be serious. Do you know what the average amount being raised into a round that we're investing into and what the average valuation is? You should know that at least as well as I do. I think it's, I think the rounds are like two, two and a half million range. We certainly have some threes and fours, and we also have some 500 to a million. We're more flexible as a firm anywhere early. I wasn't sure. I was going to guess a two on seven. Sounds good. Two or three now. We don't give people our, our numbers. Oh, why not? <laughs> I don't know, because maybe they'll use them against us when we're trying to get two on five. If they deserve it. Okay. So that's some of the basics of 10110. Obviously we work together. So I ask you a lot of my questions, but give me some of the basics of you. I said, you've started three companies raise venture for all of them, maybe start with Firefly. Yeah. So I was, I was at the MIT media lab. I was in my second year and I met a kid from Harvard business school, the way you do. And we met on an airplane and we literally just decided to start a company. It wasn't one of those. I've had a passion project for my entire life that I expect from other people. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was just, I met this guy and and the two of us really liked each other. We decided to start a company and we basically ate pizza and, and brainstormed while both of us cut class for the next semester and, and came up with this idea to, to recommend music based on this idea of collaborative filtering. So people like you, also like this other stuff. And I'd known about that technology because some other folks at the Media Lab were actually studying it and implementing it. And I quite naively walked into their office and said, hey, can you give us all your materials because we want to make a company? And they said, we're going to make a company. And so we joined forces and uh, had five founders in that company, Firefly. And we ended up doing a very popular music service. We also got into the questions of online privacy because we were collecting personal information and preference information. And ultimately Microsoft bought our company because they thought that our product, the Passport, which was a product to keep personal information in the data wallet was really interesting. And and they bought that and it became the Microsoft Passport. Okay. And now I'm going to ask one question about this. There are so many of these companies that we see nowadays that are monetize your own data exhaust sort of thing. Did Firefly color how you look at all those? Well, I I see a lot of them because maybe because of the Firefly experience and the biggest issue in that space is distribution. Like how do you get everybody to use your wallet and not some other wallet? And for us, that meant selling to Microsoft because Microsoft had 200 million desktop computers out there and we could put them on every single OS. So whenever I meet a company that's in this space, I'm always, that's the first, second and third question is how are you gonna get this thing out there? What about what goes into the wallet? Well, I think there's differing levels of PII that could go into a wallet. The way I envision a wallet that's 
done well is that you have all the PII that you need for whatever the use case is and that you authorize that use case for that provider or that app for as long as they needed to provide the service back to you that you're asking for. Just kind of conflating the notion of a wallet with the sort of monetize your data exhaust. Yeah, I, I'm not a big believer in that. I just think that the money is not, I mean, in aggregate, it's a ton of money, right? For, for a company like Facebook or Google to, you know, to take the aggregate of everybody's data and then monetize it. I think for any one person, it's not a tremendous amount of money. Right. And so it has to be really, really easy. And I think it makes you think about it, which you might not, you might not want to do it if you start to think too hard about like, is this, do I really want to share this for nine bucks a year or whatever, you know, some yeah. smaller amount or even nine bucks a month? Does that really make sense? Right, right. Well, uh, let's go back to you. The, the guy on the airplane who you started this company with was Nick, founder of Alpha Edison. Yep. Um, and then you guys decided to do another one. And another one after that. <laughs> yeah. Know. It was Nick and a guy named Max Mitral, who was our original CTO. And the three of us decided to start another company. It was called People PC. And the idea was to get people easy access to the internet in a time when it was a pain in the ass to get on the internet. So getting an, a dial-up service and getting a computer and getting figuring out which one, we put it all into a bundle that people paid for on a monthly fee. And do people know it because you guys did a lot of consumer advertising? Yeah, it, got, it ended up getting a lot of consumer advertising behind it. So we, we were very lucky. We had actually a, a hit commercial, one that, that just everybody took to this, to the actor who did it. And then in 2003, when Earthlink bought our company, you know, they ran it as a dial-up service and they poured a lot of acquisition dollars into it. And just so over the course of maybe 10 years, people saw a ton of people PC ads, particularly yeah. on television. And did you guys, you IPO'd on the NASDAQ? Yeah. Anything else just about the mechanics of an IPO? Like my understanding is you issue new shares kind of like a capital raise. It's exactly a capital raise. That's, that's what it is. I mean, you convert all the preferred to common. So you only mm -hmm. have one class of stock typically, and then you just issue more common shares and sell them. Um, there's a couple like details in there, but that's, that's the basics of it. And the thing I remember most from our IPO was the writing of the S1, which was a really interesting exercise that we didn't have when we started, we had neither a CFO or a general counsel, which shows how young we were. And I was sort of the guy because uh, Nick, my partner, was was not the kind of person who could sit in a room with a bunch of lawyers and write something that's not his thing. But, it, but so I ended up being the guy to draft the S1. So I was in this room with like 15 lawyers from all different, you know, from the banks and from us and from various places. And it was almost, sometimes I describe it as Talmudic, like we were kind of looking at the language and having long mm -hmm. discussions over words, like, can we really say it's revolutionary? Well, there wasn't <laughs> an actual revolution here. And does a revolution need guns? You know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> and you're writing this thing and and the whole process was like that, uh, which, which is really interesting for a short amount of time and then really, really boring if you do it for a while. <laughs> Oh, that's a great story. One, it blows me away that you didn't have a CFO or a general counsel and that you were essentially that person. Those people. I mean, we did get them on in that process, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. And a room with 15 lawyers. And then Spot Runner. Yeah, that's what moved me down here to LA. And Spot Runner was a rocket ship up and very hot until it stopped being hot and ended poorly. Yet we're always meeting great Spot Runner alums and investing into their companies. Yeah, Spot Runner was it was unsuccessful as a commercial endeavor and unsuccessful for investors. That doesn't mean that we didn't do a lot of things well and get a, have a lot of little successes. It just means that the outcome wasn't what we wanted it to be. So we built a fantastic team at a time that in LA to build a fantastic technical team was really hard. Back then in the sort of mid 2000s, it was nearly impossible to get somebody to relocate from the Bay Area to LA. So how did you do it? And what do you recommend to companies trying to build great tech teams now in LA? Well, it's much, much better now. Y'all have it easy. No, I, we did a really good job with PR. And I think that helped a lot. And one of the things I did was I hired Todd Gitlin, who was by far the best recruiter in LA I've ever worked with. And he, you know, he got some great people. And as you know, all engineering teams in particular, the quality of our people drew high quality people. And those people were appealing to, to other great people. And then we hired Todd Gitlin because he's a great person and we only hire great people. So now he's at 10 one ten. Exactly. Gil also used him. So all of us have used him. So I, I found this question from Gil amusing because I asked Gil and Eric what questions to ask you on the podcast. And Gil, who started 10 with you, what, like seven, eight years ago? Seven, yeah. 
almost eight. He asked, what are your tips for staying friends with someone who you've started multiple businesses with? And Nick and I, I think he's talking about Nick because I've only really started one thing with Gil. Nick and I just had tremendous amount of respect for each other. Mm. And we were very different and we're very complementary in our skills. And I think we both really appreciated that the other guy had superpowers that were different than their own. Well, what's your superpower? What are his superpowers? Uh, Nick's a great fundraiser and salesperson and strategic thinker. And, and um, what are my superpowers? I can get teams to do stuff. Okay, so maintaining respect for someone and the unique skills and superpowers they bring. But sometimes, man, as you get to know people and see their flaws, that just, it's harder. Well, I think that's your issue. <laughs> <laughs> you said that before that you respect people sometimes less after you get to know them. And I don't know if that's fully commonly true. Hopefully not. Um, with those three companies, before we move into 10110, did you have VCs that were helpful? Yeah, we did. We had a lot of great VCs, some of whom have become uh, really well known. So Brad Feld was on the board of PeoplePC and, and our earliest investor there back when he was with SoftBank. SpotRunner had Danny Reimer from Index Ventures, who was excellent. Bob Pittman, who was an independent board member and small investor, was excellent. We've been fortunate. We've had one bad investor, and that was part of SpotRunner's demise. But and, and so I know I've been bruised. I know what, what having a bad investor could do. But for the most part, we've had quite good investors. You may not want to discuss it, but you said you had all these great board members, except for one who really derailed things with SpotRunner. Yeah, mean, it wasn't even a board member. It was a board observer. Mm. Uh, yeah, we had a bad investor. And I think I can say their name. It's public record that they sued us. It was WPP. Mm -hmm. And the CEO at the time, Martin Sorrell, was a litigious dude. And the person who I think still works there, who worked for him, in corp dev slash investing, this guy Lance Marov was a, I don't know if I could say this on a podcast, a total dick. And, you know, like when he thought things were going well, he used to go on TV and brag, this is Martin Sorrell, about, you know, he basically exaggerated how much of our company he owned and like take credit for things that he couldn't, shouldn't be taking credit for. And then on the opposite side, when things weren't going well, he said that it was all about, that we were somehow focused entirely on deceiving him somehow. And when he was really never that big of a shareholder in the first place, and we certainly weren't trying to deceive anybody. Yeah. So then when they, they actually did sue us, like things were already rocky. It was 2008, 2009. We had, you know, some issues in the company and for them to then sue us, it was basically a big kick in the gut while we were down. Mm. Talk about a board member becoming part of the problem. Like they, we suddenly had a lawsuit against the company and, and against us as board members and us as individuals. So it was hugely destructive. Mm. Wow. There was something about the business model that wasn't working. It was legitimate company not working stuff. And then your investor sort of kicked you while you were down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it was actually three steps. We had some issues with the business. And then we had a macro issue, which was the meltdown in 2008, which totally eviscerated the advertising market. And then while we were kind of dealing with the second compounding on the first, then the investor came and kicked us and it just, you know, it was the nail. Mm, sucks. Totally does suck. Yeah. And that is startup life for you folks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it also taught me like, this, not everybody's rational all the time. It didn't make any sense. And yet that action and, and pretty much everything, every subsequent action that followed with them was value destroying. Mm. And it didn't make any sense. Yeah. You are always telling founders to vet their VCs, but now hearing this story, I understand what you're saying. So for WPP, I could have found out with very, very little real diligence that they were super litigious. They had a web page on their site about the people that they'd sued and basically public apologies. We never gave a public apology, by the way, we didn't have anything to apologize for, but this was like part of their business practice. Okay. So after that experience, you decided you wanted to be a VC or uh, how did that come about for you? It's something that I had thought of for years, but it sort of happened by accident. After SpotRunner, I was pretty sure I didn't want to start another full-on venture back company. And I started helping people and making some angel investments and just being an advisor. And that got me deeper in with other companies. And I just kept wanting to do it. And then I met Gil and we started investing together. And the more I did it, the more I didn't want it to be a hobby, the more I wanted it to be my profession. And uh, that's what led us to today. But so Gil had another job. So a lot of it fell on you, like a lot of the actual fund administration. Or who did you go to? What resources did you have the LA ecosystem is is a friendly one and and a very collaborative one. And back 
when I was starting out here in, in 2013, when we started 10 with 10, there were some locals who are still around, like Jim Andleman from Bonfire and TX from what was then Carlin, and now he's with Fika Ventures, and Peter Lee from Baroda, and just and the guys at Crosscut. There was a whole crowd of VCs, and but we were pretty small, so small that we often had lunch to just talk shop. And everybody made themselves really available to my questions. And I'd met VCs, of course, throughout my career. And pretty much everybody was stepped up and was willing to help and answer questions. That's great. What about mistakes that you made in your investing or in the early days of 10.1.10 that you wouldn't make again? Let me go, let me, because I know you pretty well. You don't like solo founders. More so than anyone else on our team, you have a bit of a reaction there. Did that come from having bad solo founder experience or? Yeah, first of all, I just think it's really, it's an incredibly hard thing to do with a team. And I know in my own experience, how important the relationship with another person was and how they could be up when I was down and I could be up when they were down. So it's part of me is just incredulous that people can do it without that. And then we did have some investments that didn't work out so well with solo founders. And and actually there's some data on it. It's one of those few things that has data. There was a, the startup genome did a little bit of data and it was about, I think their conclusions were, and I'm going to maul this, but that founders didn't pivot as quickly when they were solo. And that kind of mm. makes sense. You don't have that other person to push you off the bad idea and time to exit was longer. Obviously they're counter examples, right? They're spectacular counterexamples. But if you look at most of the iconic companies, even those companies that we think of with a very iconic founder like Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, they had co-founders. Yeah. We can test this more when we come up with a solo founder who we really want to invest in. How about, maybe that's a less fun question than just what's an example of a company that you really have enjoyed nerding out on? Oh, so many. Just one of many that I've really enjoyed is Second Spectrum. They're a local, really hardcore tech company here in LA. I like that. I met them early on when they were professors at USC and they were studying basketball. They were studying how you could turn the movements of players and the ball into a semantic understanding of the game of basketball. So not just this player's here or this player's there, but this is a guy doing a slam dunk or a pick and roll. And the team is really fun. The area that they're in is really fun because I like sports and they've been doing really hardcore tech. Yeah, go go second spectrum. Uh, and not just doing it for basketball, but moving into taking that computer vision and semantic understanding and, and taking it to soccer now as well. Um, so you and I both know that all the computer vision companies that come into our pipeline get you very excited. What is it about computer vision that gets you so excited? I just think it's one of those areas of AI that's living up to its hype, right? Mm. And there's a lot of AI that's not, AI is a big umbrella and a useless term, but there are, there are a lot of promises about what AI can do and, and a lot of them fall short. Computer vision is really incredible. You can drive a freaking car down the street without human intervention, in part because the car can see. And you can you can find faces out of a billion pictures. These capabilities are really incredible. And there are lots of applications for these capabilities. Is it a lot of times a fairly off the shelf camera that can do it? And then it's really a software challenge? Well, the, the other thing about computer vision is they're moving really fast. What was really expensive yesterday is cheaper today and will be cheaper tomorrow. If you look at Second Spectrum, the setups they have for the NBA, and the English Premier League, they're pretty expensive now, but the company can easily see how both the compute to do the work and the camera systems are going to get cheaper over time to the point where any game can be tracked. So computer vision is one that I know I always send to you. Health tech is another one where I feel like I can get you to take meetings. What do you see going on right now in healthcare and how are we going to get out of this mess that is sort of our healthcare system in this country? I have mixed feelings about health tech because it's really big and it's really important and it's really hard. And it's it's a slow sales cycle, particularly if you're selling to hospitals and for good reason, like hospitals aren't necessarily great places to move fast and break things. But I think there are, there are a couple trends that are macro trends that, that are unstoppable and really important. One is value-based care where people are no longer paying for the procedure, but paying for health. Actually, there are three. There's consumer-facing healthcare, where consumers are really taking control of, of their own health and looking at data and doing things that normally people use clinics to do, like monitor their blood glucose. And then telehealth, which has gotten a huge push from COVID and changed legislations, which allow doctors now to operate across state lines, which is enormous. So 
there's a lot changing in healthcare and a lot of reason to change it. And it's a very exciting place. So is that, is that one of the main things that's going on in telehealth right now, which is providers can operate across state lines? It, it, it creates venture scale possibilities. If you can have a company that can do dermatology for the entire United States or prescriptions for the entire United States, or even broader than that, but just the U.S. market, as opposed to having to, to do a state-by-state state thing, that really helps a lot. And also just people's comfort with seeing a doctor over a video call is something that was coming. And I think, you know, we've all been forced to do things that we didn't really want to do during COVID. And you know, we're realizing in a lot of cases that it's not so bad. You know, I throw at Health Tensor, which is a company that's really bringing AI and machine learning into the clinic and helping doctors make the right decisions and, and also just make their process of dealing with the medical record much, much more efficient. Health Tensor is a great example of just automated decision support for doctors. In the future, we're going to look back on doctors memorizing books and books of medical data and think it's like my mom who memorized everyone's phone number because phones couldn't store phone numbers. And we just realized there is a better way of doing things. Yeah. And I think it's important to also say that there's, there will always be room for doctors and always be a very critical role for doctors to be the interface between any systems and the patient. We both have family members who are doctors. They can look at a person and say, yeah, yeah, yeah you probably need to get that checked. And that's mm-hmm. just a, I think that intuition level ability to see if someone needs help or not is not going anywhere. Okay, so you just said it's the move to value-based care where payers pay for patient health rather than procedures done. Consumer control of their own health and telehealth. Well, there's just, there's so much going on. I mean, we don't do biotech. And uh, sometimes I'm a little sad that we don't do biotech because I think this period of history will be remembered as the combination of compute and bio and, you know, just look at the, the vaccine efforts that have just happened and how fast they were able to do it um, because of, they were able to model things. You know, I don't, we don't do it because I feel it's just too far out of my technical depth, but it's neat. Yeah, it's tempting. It is tempting. It's just, it would require a whole lot of study. Yeah. Or a different team. Or a different team, right? (laughs) Yeah. But where is 10110 going? Do you think we're aligned on that? Hopefully so. But um, maybe you can characterize your vision for where you want to be with 10110. I think we should spend the next several years really focused down on trying to get DA Wallach to join our team. I was hoping you were going to say building a podcast empire, but <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I would like to add, I think we will add capabilities to the team that we don't have now. I think that's part of what it's going to mean. And, and something that you say all the time, I think is has really become my guide for how we think about 10110, which is there's this market of founders building great things and we want to provide what they need mm-hmm. right now. Like, Nice techie investors who will lead around in LA, that's a a hole in the market and founders really need that and we can give it to them. I think in the future, those needs might be different and and we'll have different capabilities and they might have different needs. And hopefully 10110 will be an enduring institution here at LA that will help founders make stuff real. Oh, I like that. Help founders make stuff real. That's great. Um, You know, a lot of funds have aspirations to grow their AUM and we get asked, why aren't you raising more money? But I would say that you and Gil and I I'll really like the early stages. I do like the early stages. And I I think we'll always do early stage. Um, Okay. So I saved up a couple of my specific questions because, you know, usually when we have one-on-ones, I just ask you all my questions. So I was like, oh, I'll just do the same on the podcast. What, do you have any preference on notes versus safes? Uh, I think the safes are a little bit cleaner um, just because there's less in there. And from the founder's perspective, they don't have this extra added dimension of debt, which you know, it has its own rules. The safe kind of ignores all that. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know that you do not like the uncapped convertible note and I understand why, but, um, do you like the uncapped note at all? If you were founder, you just dislike it as a VC. Yeah. I dislike it as a VC. I'm sure it's, it's, it's very, it's sweet financing terms for a founder, but I think it, it creates this misalignment, right? Where if you've got an uncapped note, you're basically funding the company to get further, which will make that valuation go up, which is bad for the return on that uncapped note in some sense, if you don't have any other investment. Um, and so it fundamentally kind of misaligns you with the founder. You should be both trying to get the next best valuation. And so you're saying then if it's uncapped, I, the VC, sort of prefer that the next valuation is not higher. Assuming I have no other investment in the company, yeah. Yeah. Which is why, you know, in the case recently where we've done one, it's because 
we're already shareholders in the company and, you know. Right. Makes sense. Um, what about buying secondary? Like I did this podcast with Zach White and a huge part of their strategy is, or two of the examples he highlighted are buying secondary. What do you think about it as a sort of later stage fund strategy? Uh, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine, especially if you're already a preferred holder. So you're getting the information and you have other preferred rights. For us, we've used it. I mean, we bought secondary in a company when it was an ability for us to buy up. I mean, as you know, we like to buy up when we see things going well. So it, it can create an opportunity to buy up. But it also can allow you to bring other investors into an oversubscribed round, you know, by creating a little bit more room with secondary. So there's, there's you know, I think there's lots of places where we would use it. Got it. So we, if we have enough of the preferred from our earlier investment, then we have sort of major investor status or something like that. Well, the common is still, it doesn't have the liquidation preference. It doesn't necessarily contribute to your pro rata rights, but, but if, you, you know, if you already have information rights, then you don't need to get them again, if that's what you care about. Yep. Um, I'm going to edit out the name later, but do you remember this term sheet? Do you remember what it was that you didn't like when you saw it? I don't remember for that particular one, but basically I don't like to see anything that's non-standard. I don't like to see a super pro rata. Super mm. pro ratas can be really messy. I don't like to see terms different in any way from the lead investor to any of the other investors in that same round. I think that's that's just janky. You um, mean not just like major investor status or whatever, but... Right, beyond major investor status. I, you know, There's a company that we didn't invest in, in part out of principle, and maybe that will turn out to be a bad choice, but basically the lead investor was getting an effective lower price than everybody else in the round because of mm-hmm. supposed help that they were going to do, which to me is part of what you sign up for as a VC. So you shouldn't get paid extra for that. How um, did they structure that? They structured it as a simultaneous accelerator deal where they were getting some common shares for the for this work slash program that they were doing, but it wasn't really a work program. It sounded like the kind of help that we would do for free. Yeah. I'm not sure you want to put that in. I, whatever. It, it's interesting to me. Anything else for our founders, sort of advice you've been giving recently? No, I think the, the advice is super variable based on the founders. Right. Like some founders go a little bit too deliberately and you want to push them to go faster. Some go a little bit crazy cakes and you want to hold them in. Did you say some founders go a little crazy cakes? <laughs> I think I did. I think I did. Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Then let me circle back to you um, and talk more about you. Are you competitive? Yeah. I think you have to be like, no one is in this business who's not competitive and no one starts companies who's not a little bit competitive. Yeah. But I'm always, I always try to remind myself what I want to be competing on. I'm competitive with myself above all. That's what I'm always trying to beat is my standard mm-hmm. and what I want, what I think I ought to be doing. And that's more set by me than external observations. Like I don't need to clobber so-and-so. I need to clobber my goal. Yeah. What are your goals right now? like impact you want to have on the world with 10.1.10 as your platform. I want to invest in a bunch of companies that are incredibly successful and iconic names that people look back on and say, wow, you know, that's part of the fabric of society. Yeah. And you met them when they were two people and took a bet on them. Yeah. And it's so great. That kind of retrospective look is so fun. When you have started with a company and it's, you remember when there were just maybe a couple founders coming to visit you and then you're visiting them and you're signing into a desk and the person doesn't know you. And it's great to see that, that growth. That's like when we go to Second Spectrum and squat in their corner office and ask if we could drink some of their coffee. Yeah. What's an office? I know. I have no (laughs) idea. I love my laundry room. Okay. Final question. Hiking trail. Like, Give me one place I could just show up with my family Saturday and go hiking with them. San Jacinto. You can go up the tram halfway. Really? Yeah, and you go up the tram. A tram there. There's I've a tram been- from Palm Springs to the top of San... You could totally get to snow on the top of San Jacinto from Palm Springs. And then you can hike to the peak. I wouldn't do it with kids. But you could totally like goof around in the snow up there. It's fun. Oh, that sounds like a good activity. Maybe it's not a perfect COVID activity to hang out in a tram. but I- <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Cool. Okay, great. Anything else you think we should make sure to cover? Um, do you think you're more like Gil or Aton? I don't know. I'm more like <laughs> you probably than either of those. They're fairly different. I feel, I thought you might find kinship in one direction or another. Yeah, no, those, those elbows, they're in a class by themselves. Yeah. Um, I, 
I appreciate you coming on the podcast today, but really I appreciate that you're a great entrepreneur enabler. And I came to you and said something like, David, I really want to start this podcast. And you're like, okay. And then I was like, David, I really want to start this podcast. You're like, okay, I just went and bought you some microphones. Essentially, <laughs> you are an entrepreneur enabler. That's what I like to be. It's I know, I know. Thank you for coming on this podcast and thanks for being a great partner. Okay, thank you, Miniola. I am still recruiting for an LA-based investor, someone who wants to be in VC looking at technology for gaming and speaks Korean. It is a great role and it is posted on my LinkedIn if you know anyone. Today's episode of LA Venture is sponsored by SaaSoft, offering customized software development for your startup's needs. SaaSoft is a group of top software developers all based here in Los Angeles. If you are looking to build a new product from scratch or if you're a founder that needs help accelerating product development, SaaSoft can help. With SaaSoft, you'll get the personal attention you need to make your product a reality in 2021. Head to sassoft.com, S-A-A-S-S-O-F-T for a free consultation.